Well, good morning, Walden Church. Today's devotion, today's sermon is entitled, How to Live Life to the Full. Or I guess we could have also called it, How to Live an Extraordinary Life. And the title on paper looks great, right? Looks great. Might even make you sit up in your seat, might make you pay attention for 10 minutes. But I mean, consider the source, right? I mean, who, who am I? Who am I to give you advice about living life to the full? I don't, I don't have all the answers. My life is pretty boring. My life is pretty mundane. I mean, if, you're, if your company was going to hire a motivational speaker, they wouldn't choose me. They'd probably uh, choose Damon John. He'd be your first pick. He's best known as the founder and president and CEO of FUBU. He also is an investor on the ABC reality television show Shark Tank. He's worth $400 million and he's a motivational speaker. Uh, You could hire Arnold Schwarzenegger. He's also a motivational speaker, second most in demand. He won the Mr. Universe title at age 20, went on to win the Mr. Olympia contest seven times. He served as the 38th governor of California from 2003 to 2011, and he's worth about $300 $300 million. Or the third most popular motivational speaker is Gary Vaynerchuk. He's a businessman, author, speaker, internet personality. He used to be a wine critic and he expanded his wine uh, business. N- nobody knows content creation or digital trends or the internet better than Gary. Gary is worth $160 million. And then there's uh, Ariana Huffington. She's the founder of the Huffington Post. She's the founder and CEO of Thrive Global. She's the author of 15 books. She's worth 150 million. I am sure any one of them could give you a better talk on living life to the fullest. And my guess is they would give, <laughs> their advice would be uh, become a motivational speaker. <laughs> so first off, I wanna remind you that when you're sitting in church, When you come to a gathering like this, when you are seeking to find community in a family like this, the pastor, the speaker, the person standing up here, their job is to share God's word. God's word. This isn't my word, right? And quite frankly, I really don't matter. This isn't about me. This is not my church. I don't have the answers. God does. Your creator has the answers. Your father has the answers. And so if given the choice between the physical, the material, the earthly world, and what it believes are the answers, listening to someone whose suit costs more than I make in a year, or would you rather listen to the words of the one who made you? The one that made all of this. Did you see these pictures this week? These were the first full color images of the James Webb Space Telescope, which is about a million miles from Earth. It's the biggest telescope ever launched into space, and it'll unlock mysteries in our solar system, look beyond to distant worlds around other stars, and probe the mysterious structures and origins of our universe and our place in it. This picture is the deepest image of our universe that's ever been taken. That little slice of the universe covers a patch of sky approximately the size of a grain of sand that you would hold at arm's length standing on the ground. I mean, a being made that. A being made all of that and then made you. An intelligent being, a wise being, a loving being, and a being who wants to have a relationship with you because he made you and he's given you his word. He's given you his word so that you could live life to the fullest. Jesus said in John 10, 10, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And and abundantly sounds like a good life. Some translations even say to the full. Why, Why is that? Well, very briefly, because the Bible was not written in English. <laughs> the words of God are thousands of years old, and so originally the text was written in languages that are not as commonly spoken anymore. And when we try to write those words in English, different linguists choose different words to helpfully convey 
what they think they mean. If you had a full life, that means your life contains as much as possible. If you had an abundant life, that means your life is plentiful. And to be honest, I don't care which word you like the best because I think both sound great, <laughs> right? But what does an abundant life mean? What does a full life mean? What would a motivational speaker tell you? Probably that a full life comes from success or fame or money, right? If I'm gonna be motivated, motivate me to make a million dollars, right? And the world would tell you that you need to work hard to be successful and then you'll have money and then you'll be happy. That idea is what our society conditions as the truth. The one thing every one of us was told in our childhood years was success equals happiness. If you become successful, then you will be happy. And sadly, what that does is it creates the idea that you don't deserve to be happy unless you're successful. And that's not true. That false notion has led a lot of people to just continue to put nose to grindstone to be successful. Only until the reality sets in that success and happiness don't go hand in hand. What about money? Does money bring you happiness? You know, there was a study done on a group of people and they were all asked what was more important in life, time or money? And surprisingly, the majority of the people said time. But it wasn't by much. But what was more surprising was those same people were asked how happy they were. And the results were the same. The people who said they valued time more were also the ones who were more happy with life. When was the last time you felt happy? Satisfied. I mean, really alive. Like all your senses were just on high alert. And your energy was up, you were enthusiastic, you were radiant, you felt like you were on top of the world. Can you even remember the last time you enjoyed life so much that you laughed until you cried? And the last time your alarm went off in the morning and you were just happy because you couldn't wait to just wake up and take on another day? Or do you feel like life is just dull and uneventful and uninspiring and unexciting? And I said, hey, what's your, uh, what's your life Bible verse? And you'd say, oh, it's probably Ecclesiastes. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless, everything is meaningless. <laughs> do you ever feel like life is just one big, huge disappointment after another? And I'm, I'm not talking about, you, you know, your personality. I'm not talking about that. I, I'm a pretty happy person, but my face doesn't show it, right? I'm, I'm very happy. I'm very content. I'm just not a smiling person. And, and there, there are those people, right, that are just bubbly and energetic. And I'm not talking about temperament, okay? I'm not talking about your personality today. And I'm also not talking about the... The, the beer commercial life, you know, those commercials on TV where there's beautiful people, there's nothing wrong, and everyone's just happy, happy, and everybody's having fun. That's, that's not reality, right? You know that's what people, that's not what people look like when they sit around and drink beer. <laughs> that's marketing, right? It's a deliberately false image that's created to help sell you a product. The world tries to sell you their version of happiness. They try to sell you a full life. That passage from Jesus in John 10, there's, there's more to it. At the very beginning, he says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. See, there's a contrast, Jesus says, between what the world says and what God says. There's a contrast between the world's way of doing things and God's way of doing things. There's your father's way, right? And then there's the world's way. There's the secular way. There's the Facebook way. There's the 30 second commercial way. 
And, and that is to pursue things that can be measured, to pursue things that can be purchased. But your father says, those things steal from you and they kill and they destroy. And Jesus says, that's why I came. I came so that you could have the life that you were born for, the life your father made you for. Did you know that you can actually pursue happiness instead of pursuing success? You, you can pursue an abundant life without pursuing success. And if that's the life you want, then claim that. Pursue that. Your father's desire for you is to know a fullness of life here on earth. His desire is that you could honestly respond to the question, how are you doing? And, and, and you could say, life is good. You know what? It, it isn't easy. It, it's complicated sometimes. Sure, it has its ups and downs. But at the core of it, life is good. And if you can't say that, then like Jesus says, you have been robbed of life, robbed of the joy that your creator has for you. The thief has slipped into your life and stolen something that doesn't belong to him and he's replaced that true life that God desires and he's given you a false, plastic, fake life. Again, I'm not talking about a life that's devoid of challenge or difficulties. I'm not suggesting that Jesus says you're gonna have some luxurious life that, you know, with no pain. I'm talking about how you feel about your life in the midst of all that is here on earth. And that includes challenges, that includes disappointments, that includes sickness, that includes loss. In the midst of all of that, that you are still living a full life, still living an abundant life. You know, one of the early writers of faith was a man named Paul. And most of what we have from Paul is correspondence. He wrote letters, a physical paper and ink, right, to various cities that he had visited just to keep in touch with them and to continue to encourage them. But one of the longer, more special of his writings was a book called Romans. And Paul seems to have written Romans as a way to sum up how he sees faith and how he sees God working in the world. It's a very methodical book. It starts and it follows a very logical progression. And some people who have read it says, uh, they say that the, the book is so comfortable, it feels like you're just walking on a road. In chapter six, Paul says life begins by dying. He says, what shall I say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. That seems like a really strange place to start, doesn't it? That that to begin to live, the first thing you need to do is die. Not physically die. The Bible is not always a literal book. No, here Paul is saying that you should begin by dying to sin. In other words, we should die to the way of life that everyone else is just fine with, and we should embrace something better. Paul says you can't live an abundant life if you have not first died to the world's way. And he compares it to being baptized. Have you ever wondered why Christians get baptized? It sounds like a really weird practice, right? Well, baptism is the idea that you die, you go under the water, you go underground, right? It, you, your old life is buried, it is buried in the past. We go under the water and then we participate in Jesus' death. We become part of that same story. Verse four makes the reason clear. We are buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. The point is so that we can live in this newness of life, the new life that Jesus talks about in John 10, which is the full, rich, satisfying life. 
Look at what he says next. For we have been united with him in death, like his. We shall certainly be united with him in resurrection, like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin, once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Paul says, you can join with Jesus in his death, and then we join with him in new life. Anyone who is baptized, they go under, but they also come back up, right? They come back up out of the water. And you see, Jesus' death and resurrection, when that took place, that was all anyone could ever talk about. I mean, for years and years and years, <laughs> over 500 people saw Jesus alive and walking around after he was crucified. So you can imagine that that story was the only story people wanted to talk about. And it was the story that everyone wanted to be a part of. There's no other story that could compete. And his followers grew and grew, and everyone wants to be a part of something that can make a difference. Everybody wants to be a part of something that is bigger than themselves. And baptism was a symbolic way that you could identify with Jesus and show the world that you were going to claim the life that you were made for. And I think a lot of us get the first part, you know, being united with Jesus in death. Humans, we tend to be drawn to pain and suffering and hardship and death. So we, we get that, right? We get hard times. Jesus lived a hard time and then he died. Been there, right? But he didn't just physically die. The reason Jesus died was so that sin would die. Jesus didn't just throw himself down on a sword and then shout back, run, save yourself. That's not what happened. No, Jesus saw that darkness had a hold on you. And pain was like a blanket around you. You, you were covered in this aura, this cloud, this shadow, and it caused you to lie. It caused you to hurt other people. It caused you to backstab to look out only for yourself. And when you looked in the mirror, you only saw failure. And you listened to all those negative voices. No, what Jesus did on the cross was he grabbed that outer cloak of darkness off of you. All that black, sticky tar and death and sickness that hung over you. And he wrapped that as a cloak around himself and then he took all of that to the cross. And when he was killed, your sin was killed right along with him. And we go under the water. But we come back up out of the water. That's the part we don't understand. That's the part that needs some work. I don't think we really understand what it means to live with him in his resurrection. Maybe we think, oh, that's, you know, that's off in the future. One day when we're all in heaven. But... No, Jesus talks about you living a full and abundant life now, on earth. Paul writes Romans 6, he's not talking about the future. He's talking about the life that you can live here and now. He's saying you put your old self to death and you claim a new self. He's talking about a, an experience and a life where you can participate in the resurrection of Jesus today. To put it simply, now you are new. You were created, but now you are recreated. You have a new nature, and it's not controlled by the physical. It's controlled by the spiritual. The gospel is not just that your sins were paid for, but it's also that you have a new life. You have a resurrected life. It, it wouldn't be good news if we said that you would claim your new life in the distant future. After you die. Oh, after you die, then you can enjoy happiness. Then you can have a full life. No. You can have a full life, an abundant life, now. Chapter 6, verse 11 says, So you must also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. 
Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. So Paul says, if you have a new life, then you should live your new life, right? So it's like if you used to live in a rundown shack, right? And it had dirt floor, and there was holes in the roof, there was no central air, there was a smell, you were living on a moldy mattress, and then someone came along and gave you the keys to a mansion for a lake estate. Would you say, well, you know, can I keep the keys to my old place? I might want to go back there and visit sometime. No. That's what verses 11 through 14 are talking about. Paul basically says, since you have this new life with Jesus, this resurrection life, then live in it. He says, count yourself dead to sin and alive in God. Don't let sin reign in you. Do not offer parts of your body to sin. He says, sin is no longer your master. In other words, stop living in the shack and live in the mansion. He's talking about living a holy life, living a life that's in service to God, not a life that lives in a service to sin, to desires, to our wicked thoughts, to selfishness. He's trying to teach us that the old sinful part has been put to death and we need to live in the new and not return to the old. Why? Because it's better, right? It's healthier. It's real, right? It's not a fake plastic imitation. Tell me something, and, and this, this might be hard to answer, so I understand if it gives you a little bit of pause, but what does it mean to live? I mean, are you getting by or are you living? Are you existing? Or are you living? You see, sadly, there is a war going on around what is true. And I don't think anyone purposefully believes a lie. I don't think anyone purposely tries to deceive other people. But it seems many of us have a hard time understanding what is true. We certainly all have opinions, right? Oh yeah, we all have opinions. <laughs> and we all certainly seem to think that we can offer sound advice, right? But opinions and advice and even good intentions they're not truth let me tell you something if you're doing research and all of your research is being done on the internet it's probably not true if you believe something that somebody else told you about God or about the Bible, it's probably not true. This road that Paul is trying to walk with you, at the end of it, it's joy-filled, loving, abundant. The being that made you out of the same material that he made those stars from, he made you and he wants to give you life. So the first step in walking that road is to know the truth. And the truth is, that we can participate in a brand new life with Jesus. And the first step is the first step. It's abundant. It's life-filled, joy-filled, love, relationships, meaning, risk. That's what it means to live. 1 John 4, 7 says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. There's been a lot of talk in the world about love lately and what love is and what love means. But God says love comes from him. So it's his. He claims it. He gets to define it. And he in turn instructs us, love one another. Tell me something. And you might know a lot about Jesus or you might know very little about Jesus. But from what you do know about Jesus, would you say that loving one another was one of his most important teachings? Absolutely, right? There's a lot of unknowns in this world. The world seems to get more and more gray, more and more confusing, more cloudy. 
You can easily cut through all of that. Love one another. If Jesus came right now, and you all lined up with your most important question, but Jesus, what about this? What, what about this? What about this? I guarantee you that he would tell you to love one another. In fact, I think he even said those exact words. John 13, a new commandment I give you that you love one another just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. Hey, look, it's a command. It's a command. This new life, this abundant life, it is characterized by love. And the secret to living an abundant life is to be abandoned in love to God. Hate is wrong. Guilt is wrong. Shame is wrong. The only motivation powerful enough to sustain us is to love God and to love others with everything that we have. Start with those closest to you. Start with your family. Start with your church family, your friends. Love them deeply, without reservation. Do something a little bit unexpected to, and demonstrate the love that you have for them. Do it for your family, or if it's for somebody else, then do it with your family. Because you see, it's never enough for us to just feel deep love and not show it. Friends, if you want to claim this life in Jesus, I'm challenging you to love deeply. I know it's risky. I know sometimes that hurts, and I know it means being open, and it means being vulnerable. I know it means loving strangers and loving enemies and loving people who live differently. But if we're going to live deeply and fully, then we need to love deeply and fully. Love was the reason for the cross. Love was the reason for the tomb. A love we didn't deserve. And it was given to us anyway. God loved us with abandoned without borders or limits or conditions. Truly living means truly loving. Second, I would say, invest in relationships. First Thessalonians says, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. Now this might sound very similar to love one another, but I don't, I don't mind being repetitive. <laughs> I'm gonna go out on a limb and guess that most of the times that you felt true love were experienced in the context of a relationship. I mean, we're talking about living life to the full, right? Well, what happens when you win a race? What happens when you do well on a test? What happens when you get promoted or something great happens to you? You go tell someone, right? It almost doesn't even seem real until you tell someone. You, you want to share that experience with another person. So life is about relationships. And you know what's ironic? During the pandemic, you know, we all stayed away from church. And we all stayed away from the mall. And we all stayed away from theaters and from shopping. And that was at the beginning. And we all hated it. We all hated being locked up in our house. It was boring. But now that the world is getting back to normal, we've forgotten that one of the most joy-filled experiences that we can have is a relationship with another person. Church attendance is down all over the U.S. Why? People say, ah, I can worship God at home. Well, that's right, you can. I can read the Bible at home. Also true. I can pray at home. Very true. But you can't have church at home. You can't fellowship at home. You can't interact with other people at home. You can't experience new faces. You can't meet new people. You can't love your neighbor as yourself at home. Living an abundant life is also about having relationships. As disciples, we follow Jesus. Jesus did not work from home. Jesus didn't hide. 
Jesus didn't hunker down, even when the world was out to get him. If you want to live life, you need to invest in the lives of other people. Take time to be with other people. Make a new friend. Kickstart a friendship that has been on the back burner for a while. Get together with one of those good friends that you always say you don't spend enough time with. Helen Keller says, when we do the best we can, we never know what miracle is wrought in our life or the life of another. I know it takes time. That's why, that's why I use the word invest and, and take the conversation to a deeper level. Talk about your experiences with God. Share your joy, share your pain, share your soul. Third, pursue meaning. Pursue meaning. I don't believe the word of God instructs us to pursue success or wealth or investing, but I do believe the Bible instructs you to pursue a life of meaning. Why are people still talking about Jesus? Good or bad? Why is Jesus still relevant? He lived 2,000 years ago. There's got to be something new to talk about. Well, just because something's new doesn't make it better. And it certainly doesn't mean it's true. In fact, some of the most truest things in the world are also the oldest. And people are still talking about Jesus because of the incredible life that he lived. And he lived a life of meaning. Remember the verse that we had from earlier, Ecclesiastes 1-2? Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. The guy who wrote that, he was trying to find meaning in the world. And his search kept taking him further and further and further away from God. He pursued wisdom. He pursued pleasure. He pursued wealth. He pursued materialism, authority, security, war. And at the end of his search, he wrote these words. It's all meaningless. And that was just chapter one. But by the end of the book, he has another thing to add. Ecclesiastes 12 says, the end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. He says, fear God. Now, fear uh, was the Hebrew way of saying respect or, or worship. And keep his commandments. If he wrote these words today, he would say, at the, end of the, the, at the end of the day, after all is said and done, worship the Lord and do what he says. To find meaning, the author says, stop looking out there and start looking up. If you want to experience more of this full life that God's word talks about, spend your time on the things that you know are meaningful and true. Serve each other. Help someone in need. Sometimes the things that have the most meaning don't have deadlines. And lastly, risk it all. In Luke 9, 23, Jesus offers up a very terrifying command. He says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. Yes, this is the meaning behind the symbol of baptism. And there is a part of this instruction that is allegory, that is metaphor. Jesus says, though, very clearly, to be my disciple, you need to risk it all. You know, the divine miracle of Christmas was that God became mortal. He, he risked it all. He subjected himself to hunger and pain and death, all so that he could show you firsthand what love looked like. I would also offer that every time God creates a new person, he risks it all. That that new person would not then return his love. It's very possible that each new person that's born will grow into a person that hates him. Isn't that amazing? That our Creator gives us that much freedom. He doesn't make us love him. He doesn't force us. He doesn't threaten us. 
1 John 4 says, we love because he first loved us. When you love first and give first, extend first, when you offer first, when you speak first, you also risk first. And risk is scary. Reading your Bible at home is easy. Reading your Bible with others and asking questions about faith is scary. Praying for sick friends and relatives is easy. But asking for prayer for yourself, admitting your trials and your brokenness to others is risky. Saying, we'll pray for you, or just typing the words praying on Facebook is easy. Stopping and actually praying for them aloud is risky. Love is risky. Relationships are risky. Finding meaning in life is risky. You know, even though I'm not a famous, a motivational speaker, I bet if you had hired one of those million dollar speakers, they would tell you the same thing. To succeed, to be famous, to be rich, you have to risk. See, the difference is how you define success, how you define wealth. Is it investing in a large bank account or is it investing in the lives of others? I guess you could say Jesus was a motivational speaker. You could also say he had a lot of followers. One time, in one of his teachings, he said, whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life, for my sake, will find it. Listen, if your life is more empty than it is full, I want to encourage you to make a change. Begin right now. Allow your old self to be lost and discover a new life with Jesus. If you look at your life and you feel like that your joy has been stolen by a thief, Jesus says, take it back. Because God's desire for us is to experience life to the full. And if that sounds like the life you want, if that sounds like the life you've always wanted, I would invite you to right now, talk to your creator and tell him that you are ready to live. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for sending your son, Jesus, so I could be your friend. Thank you for taking a risk with me and loving me. Thank you for being with me all my life, even when I didn't know it. And I realize now that I need a savior to set me free from sin and from myself and from all the habits and hurts and hangups that mess up my life. I wanna claim my new abundant life with you. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I wanna repent and live the way that you created me to live. Be the Lord of my life. Save me with your grace. I want to learn to love you and trust you and be everything you made me to be. Thank you for creating me and choosing me to be a part of your family. Amen. I want to remind you that we are here. There is a church in your neighborhood. There is a church in your community that misses you and would love to have you, to see you, to meet you. Begin to build love in the world around you. Begin to build relationships with the people around you. Risk. Invest in life. Every Sunday we have two services. We have one at 9.30. It's a more traditional service. We have a choir and we're gonna sing a lot of the hymns that you remember growing up. And then at 11 o'clock, we have a contemporary service. We have a worship team, and we encourage you to come as you are. Come however you feel the most comfortable. It's more important that you're here than you're worried about how you look or how you dress. We have a full children's program at 11 o'clock as well. 
We have a nursery all the way through high school, and we have a youth group, and you can follow our youth group on Instagram. Please reach out to our youth director and ask about our calendar and what our kids are doing. Uh, they're going to summer camp in a couple of weeks, and I know they're really excited about that. And then we got school starting in August, and so uh, we'll be gearing up for uh, fall and kids going into new grades. And so uh, we're looking forward to the abundant life that God has for our church, and we want to be the church where you live. I love you guys. I'll see you next time. Bye.